Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming to this session. Thanks for choosing this session among uh, a dozen of other interesting sessions, which is called Benefits of Eclipse Che when developing multi-containers application. My name is Eugene Ivansov, and I'm an engineer with Red Hat uh, Developer Group, uh, namely people who work on Eclipse Che, a Kubernetes native uh, cloud IDE. And uh, today, the agenda uh, will go as follows. Uh, I will give a brief introduction of Eclipse Che, uh, what it is, some history facts. Uh, then we'll go through cloud, uh, cloud native development challenges and what Eclipse Che is actually offering to solve them. And then, yeah, away with the boring stuff and slides, uh, we'll actually launch Eclipse Che, deploy a multi-services, uh, multi-container application uh, into a, my local Kubernetes cluster and play with the stuff uh, for a little while. All right, so what's Eclipse Che uh, and why, why we're here at, uh, at this very conference? Uh, what Red Hat has to do with uh, Eclipse Che. So Eclipse Che is an open source project and uh, it has been with Eclipse Foundation since uh, 2016. It's not uh, the next version of, uh, of a traditional desktop Eclipse, right? So it's a different, uh, different concept, entirely different concept, uh, which we'll talk about later. Uh, the project has got uh, uh, Five point K stars, if that matters. Uh, there are over 100 releases, even more at this point, I think. Um, there are almost 100 contributors to the project. Uh, the biggest of those are uh, SAP, Red Hat. And the project has been forked uh, uh, 800 times, something like that. So what's Eclipse Che? Uh, it's uh, it's a uh, workspace server, workspace orchestrator, uh, and a cloud ID, a web-based JavaScript ID that you'll get in your browser. So by having Eclipse Che, you do not only have the web editor, but you actually get uh, an environment that your project needs uh, to be built, run, and debugged. And at this moment, Eclipse Che supports uh, three infrastructures. It's Docker, OpenShift, and Kubernetes. And by, by saying supports infrastructure, uh, I mean that Eclipse Che both runs on that infrastructure and it uses that infrastructure as a, as a runtime to create cloud workspaces. Uh, and the cloud ID is what, you, uh, what you'll get in your browser. So once Eclipse Che is deployed, uh, all you need is, is a browser so you can have Chromebook or very weak uh, laptop uh, to have a powerful 16 gig cloud workspace with all of the tooling, all of the compilers, all of the runtime that your particular huge enterprise project needs. Um, so what's the biggest problem that, one of the biggest problem that Eclipse Chase is trying to solve is, yeah, is this. I think uh, every one of you sitting here have said that multiple times to your colleagues, to your managers, to newcomers in your team, to whoever's uh, saying that the readme of your project doesn't really work for, for Fedora 27 and this OpenJDK version and that Maven version and stuff like that. So it always works on, on our machines, right? If it doesn't work on my machine, then probably I'm, I'm not doing a very good job as an engineer. But if I give you some random project and a very good readme and you're trying to, to follow it, I'm sure like 30% of people sitting here will say, no, it doesn't work. Just because of differences in operating systems, differences in um, versions, even minor versions of the software you, you use, Different version of NPM can cause huge troubles or, you know, my big legacy project uh, requires Maven 3.1 uh, 
and, and not, uh, not the newer one. So Eclipse J is trying to solve uh, this problem and by having an Eclipse J workspace, um, you can guarantee that it works on every machine. Uh, the next problem is that we've seen this trend to come from big monolithic apps to, uh, to microservices. So uh, it turns out that if you deploy your application as many small components, uh, it's easier to maintain, it's easier to upgrade, it's easier to solve problems, it's easier to debug. And the challenge, the real challenge is that when developing an application that will run out there in the cloud as a, as a set of Kubernetes containers, developing it locally doesn't guarantee you that you know, the work you've done locally and tested locally uh, will work and will behave exactly the same way uh, when your DevOps and when your admins uh, trigger some CI job and the stuff will go uh, to staging and then eventually to production. So Eclipse J is trying to replicate your production environment and run your production in a uh, dev mode. So the problem, <clears throat> what we love containers for and why Kubernetes is so hugely popular. A container is something that behaves exactly the same way no matter where it's run. Right, so if you put your app into the container, uh, you can guarantee that it will, the behavior will be the same as long as it runs in a uh, Kubernetes cluster. So containers are predictable and they are run exactly the same way uh, anywhere they run. So uh, localhost development. So if, uh, when you start working on a, on, a, on a project, the first thing you need to take care of is your environment, right? So all of us are localhost ninjas, right? So you know exactly how to pull this database, you know exactly what ID and what settings you need for your project, uh, and you're forced to do so uh, to be successful. But um, localhost environment is always different, right? And it never replicates your production or staging environment, uh, never replicates it entirely. Thus, uh, there are no guarantees that uh, uh, the behavior will be the same. Um, Eclipse J is providing a solution for that. So instead of being a local host ninja, right, instead of uh, taking care of all of the dependencies, uh, all of the build and runtime tools, uh, Eclipse J is offering uh, the following solution. You kind of grab your uh, production, your application definition as a Kubernetes YAML, and uh, you can convert it into Eclipse J workspace. And Eclipse J will add uh, all of the developer tooling uh, on top of it, uh, not even on top of it, but uh, as a sidecars. So in the end, you will have your application runtime, uh, which you will own, which uh, you'll be able to modify, uh, and you will get uh, all of the developer tooling uh, that you'll need to be productive as a developer. The IDE, uh, the actual uh, build and runtime containers and other stuff uh, will take care, uh, will uh, take a look uh, a bit later. So how it works. Um, we put your uh, application recipe in the center. So because it's your application and you know uh, what what images, what tools it requires. Then uh, you can choose uh, the IDE, um, which will be a, a web-based IDE. You will choose the tooling. So if this is a Java, Golang, and Node.js application, like uh, using all those stacks uh, as microservices, uh, you can choose the tooling in Eclipse J and uh, that tooling will be launched as containers uh, alongside your application recipe. You can also choose build containers, uh, which, uh, may, which may be using images, uh, the same images that, for example, your CI uses. 
so that when, when you build a project in Eclipse J, uh, you can guarantee that you're using the same uh, build environment, the same build settings as your CI does. Because, yeah, oftentimes uh, successful build on your laptop doesn't mean successful build uh, on the CI system when you push the code. So uh, all of the containers of uh, Eclipse J environment uh, will be using shared volumes. So they will all have access to, to the source code that uh, you will git clone. Uh, it will use Kubernetes recipes, uh, Kubernetes services, uh, to communicate with each other. So internal endpoints. Um, as said, you can have diff different build and run containers. And finally, you can use a, a remote debugger. So all of that, just having, um, you know, uh, Eclipse J in your in your browser. So what's a workspace environment? It consists of several containers. Uh, a pod may consist of several containers. You may have an environment that has several pods. For example, if your complex application requires a, uh, a database or some J proxy, some auxiliary containers, uh, you can use all that in your J workspace to, to replicate uh, the environment that will be used uh, uh, when your application is running uh, in your staging, for example. So this environment is defined by a Kubernetes recipe. Uh, we also uh, support Docker images and compose files, but the next version of Eclipse J will support only OpenShift and Kubernetes. Uh, shared volumes, as said, all containers have shared volumes, so uh, you can run build command in your uh, build container, and build artifact will be available in run container, and uh, you can launch your application and test it. And servers to expose uh, Services, for example, if you need a preview URL uh, to your application, to your web app, or you want to share this URL with someone to check out the application that is running in your workspace, you can do so by creating OpenShift routes or Kubernetes ingresses. Um, the ID, it's a fast modern JavaScript ID that has client-server architecture. Uh, it, there is a new pluggability module in the IDE that is used and that will be demoed today. It's uh, Eclipse Thea. And uh, uh, the Eclipse J7 release will include the pluggability model that will make it possible to run VS Code extensions uh, with uh, Eclipse J. So you can grab any extension from VS Code Marketplace and run it in, in a web-based ID, which is Eclipse Thea. Um, there is plugin registry where uh, plugins, apart from VS Code uh, Marketplace, uh, where uh, you can add uh, your own plugins and you can run your own copy of uh, plugin registry in your particular cluster. Uh, you can have custom IDE per workspace. So if this is a Python workspace, um, the workspace configuration will include all of the tooling required for Python. If this is a Java workspace, your IDE will look different uh, because it will include some, uh, some Java tooling, new menus, new side panels, and stuff like that. And you can use different IDEs as well. Um, Currently, Thea is uh, uh, the one that is included by default. There is also a legacy GWT ID, but there are experiments with uh, uh, including IDs like uh, uh, Python, Jupyter, and, and, and stuff like that. Tooling. Um, as I said, Eclipse J will, uh, will try to make you as productive as developer as possible. And uh, most of the tooling is backed up, backed up by language servers. So uh, Eclipse Thea implements language server protocol. And all of the auto-completion refactoring go to definition and all of the things you expect to navigate code, to, to debug, 
are uh, backed by language server protocol and debug adapter protocol, right? So, and language servers are used by uh, respect to VS Code extensions. So when you install uh, Java support extension in VS Code, uh, it actually starts a Java language server uh, that the client communicates with and the language server then uh, gives uh, all of the uh, project details, auto completion prompts and navigates you through the code, etc. Build containers, as said above, um, it may be or it may not be important, but oftentimes it is important to use uh, exactly the same uh, build environment as your, uh, for example, CI has. And it's important to decouple build process from, from the runtime. Uh, it also makes it possible to use smaller images for the runtime that don't include, uh, for example, Maven and stuff, only just bare JDK. Build containers uh, have shared volumes, so build artifacts are then available in, in other containers. And you can manage resources. Uh, you can, um, since it's your application, uh, you know exactly how much RAM you need to run MVN clean install in that. So you can allocate as much memory uh, as the application may require. So, um, the process and the demo that uh, uh, I will run uh, will include deployment of, of the app uh, uh, to Kubernetes. Then you grab the workspace recipe and convert it to um, Eclipse J workspace. And once done uh, with the developer work in your Eclipse J workspace, you have multiple options like push into CI and that will trigger uh, rebuild of your images. Uh, or you can interact with your Kubernetes cluster uh, directly from the IDE and uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift plugins uh, for Thea, which are actually uh, VS Code extensions for Kubernetes and OpenShift, uh, are almost there, will be uh, included in J7 release. So you'll be able to, to deploy an application right from, from your IDE um, being in the same cluster, but a different namespace. All right, um, uh, those were the slides. I'll start with, uh, with this demo and uh, a little bit of information of what you're going to see. So we'll deploy a microservices app to, to a Kubernetes cluster. It'll be my local Minishift. Uh, it's already deployed there, so nothing special about it. OC apply and a huge YAML with the definition uh, of my application. Then uh, we'll uh, develop, we'll try to uh, play with the code of my application in Eclipse J workspace. Then we'll push to GitHub and then we'll see what this push may do. Uh, it's one of the scenarios of what happens when you check out the code when you commit and push and uh, how this can be integrated in uh, CI CD processes. All right. So the application that uh, I'm using for, <coughs> for this demo uh, is a dead simple uh, microservices application. Uh, it's a to-do app, uh, a web application where you, you know, add to-dos or remove to-dos. And it has authentication API, uh, user's API. There is some very simple front end. Uh, and there is a to-do API and uh, a Redis database to store the information. So authentication API is a, written in Golang. Users API is a Spring Boot application. Front end is some Vue.js stuff. And uh, to-do's API is a Node.js app. So uh, not sure that you know, this combination uh, happens frequently in, in real life, but uh, yeah, this is to demonstrate the polyglot uh, multi-languages um, ID. Okay, uh, let's get started with that. So I have uh, deployed this <coughs> application uh, in my uh, OpenShift cluster. So you can see several uh, 
several pods and uh, one of the services is exposed so that uh, we can hit this route and uh, it will ask me to log in, <coughs> which I will do. Oops, something went wrong. It doesn't work. Is it demo effect or not? It is not. Let's um, take a look. Maybe there are some issues related to that problem. Okay. <laughs> I was warned about the internet. <laughs> Come on. <sighs> yeah, we're good. Almost. So for that particular problem, I have registered a GitHub issue. Yeah, last year in October. Never fixed it ever since. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so let's do it now. I think it's high time because I will run into that at every demo, which is not good. So a GitHub issue. Uh, with the description and uh, looks like a typical GitHub issue, but not quite. There is uh, this magic button which says check it out in Eclipse J workspace. Let's uh, click it. <clears throat> so what happens now? What that magic button does is um, we call it a, an Eclipse J factory uh, so that, that's a, a link uh, that, uh, that actually calls CHE API with a request to create a workspace. Uh, there are some errors here and there. It's the consequence of uh, grabbing the nightly build. So what happens there is um, uh, CHE will create a workspace based on the application recipe uh, that I have provided. Uh, all right, so we have, we have the IDE and we have the source code. So nothing special so far, it's just, you know, uh, a web-based editor. But let's uh, go back to my OpenShift to a different namespace where I actually deploy Che. So this part is Eclipse Che server and the ID deployed on OpenShift. And uh, this part here is my workspace. So creating and starting a workspace in Eclipse Che is not just starting an instance of a web editor, right? It's starting the environment as you described it for your particular application. So what I did for this workspace, I grabbed all those YAMLs, or it's just one YAML, that I used to deploy the application, the original one, the one that has an error that we are hopefully going to fix. And uh, I converted it to an Eclipse Che workspace and chose some tooling based on what uh, what tools my application requires, and I know that this is Golang, this is Java, and this is Node.js. If we uh, peek into the pod, right, you can see that this, <coughs> this pod consists of different containers. It has containers for my authentication API with uh, Golang and GoPath and all of this stuff. It has got a container for users API to be able to, to run uh, and compile my Spring Boot application. And it has got other containers. Uh, one of those is, is Thea. So this is the actual ID. Uh, this container, for example, is a container that, that is used for a plugin that provides uh, shell access to, uh, to all, of the, all of the containers uh, here from the IDE. 
So once again, uh, starting an Eclipse Che workspace is virtually grabbing your production uh, application definition and running it as a, as a, as a developer sandbox uh, in your Kubernetes cluster. Let's get back to the, to the IDE. So now uh, what I know, I know that uh, I've, got, uh, I've got an application that is not working, right? And uh, something went wrong. Not a lot of information there for me to debug. Uh, but since, you know, I know uh, what happens where, um, it's obvious that uh, from front end, uh, the request goes first to uh, authentication API, and authentication API calls users API. So what I'll do is uh, I will run this application in my uh, developer workspace in Eclipse Thea. And to do so, I will use commands. So now I'm running uh, an exec into my front end container, and I will restart the server and get uh, the, the URL to preview it. So I'm choosing the command, and I'm choosing uh, the conta uh, which container I want to execute this command in. So which container in my workspace I'm, I'm interested in right now. So that will be front end. I'm restarting the server, and now uh, this is my container, right? This is my pod, it's not production. I can, I can mess with it, I can kill it, then I can fix it. Uh, I'm not, you know, I'm not messing up with, uh, with the environment that is out there. All right, um, I can preview it uh, right here. Let me. Okay. I will log in. And I have the same error. All right, so obviously I need to, to take a look what's happening with one of my components in that application, uh, namely uh, authentication API, uh, which is a Golang, uh, Golang component. I'll go to auth API, go to main Go. Uh, you can see that uh, I'm having all sorts of, uh, of help in here. So that is the language server that is running in one of the containers that I've defined for uh, for my IDE, for my workspace. And we can see what's happening here is um, there is user API address. Uh, so the application is, is then passing this request to, to user service. You see I can, um, I can navigate through code uh, as well in here. Right, so user go, uh, username, last name, and stuff like that. So now I will rerun this service. So in, 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 in this pod, in these containers, I can stop services, rerun them, uh, uh, debug to, to find out what's going wrong. Um, so I will just um, run another command. It will be authentication API, and the container is also authentication API. It will recompile my Golang, and I can do so because I have the right environment, I have the right Go path in there, I've got the right dependencies either in Go path or vendor folder, so I can totally do so. And now I can log in again, and yeah, I'm taking a look at, uh, at the error message, and it says here that, um, what? Path users admin is not found. So it's not my Golang component that is faulty, right? It's not the one to blame. That component is calling uh, users API. Let's take a look at users API then. It's a uh, Spring Boot application. Let 
there is user's controller, right? And by just looking at the, uh, at the REST methods, yeah, I can see that someone not smart enough has changed the endpoint and there are no tests. That's why it compiles okay, but um, yeah, the endpoint is user, so that explains my 404. Yeah, uh, pretty stupid mistake, but very easy to, to demo though. Uh, right, so I will fix it. Yeah, sometimes a fix is a very simple <laughs> one line, but it takes a while to figure it out. Now, um, I have to recompile my uh, Spring Boot application and rerun it uh, in my workspace to verify that my fix works. Let's do so. Um, once again, I will use a command. No, I will use, uh, this time I will use a terminal. So I can open a terminal and run tasks or which are actually Kubernetes execs into any of the containers, right? So I can uh, play with my environment uh, the way I want. And I have demoed commands, uh, but you can totally go on the command line and run So um, I am running this in a container which is different uh, from the one uh, where my user's API runs. So it's my build container. It has got Maven, right? And once built is a success, the build artifact, the jar, will be available in my uh, user's API container. So this is what I'll do. Run task. And I will update my user's API. Oh, it's building it. No, I need update. So I am restarting my Spring Boot application uh, with the right with the fix, with the right uh, endpoint of, of the API that, uh, that another component is calling. And, and there you go. So I have fixed it. So hopefully we'll do something else for future demos. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll mess with another endpoint probably. Um, Right, so once I have it, uh, I can do the same things with, uh, with other components, like say I wanna change something um, with my uh, front end. Right, so my server is, is started there in watch mode, I can, you know, do such sort of things, well, it depends on, on the technology you're actually using. Uh, now, I've got, I've got a fix, but that's half of the deal, right? So it works on my machine, kind of. I need to deliver that fix or change it uh, or test it, verify uh, against the, the environment that was used uh, in my different namespace. Okay, so I will go back to my DevConf, check that it's still not working on my production. Let's call it my production. Uh, there are several options that I can choose now. I will show two of them. I've got a working uh, user's API in my namespace in here, in my Eclipse J namespace, right? So why can't I point my production app if I have access, and luckily I have access here. 
why can't I point it to, to the component that is working properly in my workspace, right? So uh, to do so, I will go to, uh, to my workspace services, so internal endpoints, and uh, go to users API and create a route. So I will, I have exposed this service, right? And then I go to my namespace here, devconf, the bad one, so where, where the, the error is. I will go to authentication API deployment and go to environment. And you can see that my Golang component uh, is going to uh, users API using uh, users API service name, right? So an internal DNS that is resolved to an in, uh, internal IP in a Kubernetes cluster. But uh, I can do this trick You can see that uh, uh, user, the authentication API has been redeployed. So you can see a, a second deployment active in there. So now this component is actually using a, a service that the fixed service that runs in my Che workspace. And now if I go in here, Still doesn't work. <laughs> Interesting. Users API calls. Let me take a look. Maybe the deployment is missing? No, it's a. Uh, The trick didn't do it. Um, authentication users. Now let's check the logs. Uh, yeah, I think up. Let's go back to here. Routes. Yeah, I think it's the wrong route. Services, users. All right, that didn't work. <laughs> the route refuses to work properly. Users API, yeah. Okay, it could have been a nice wow demo. <laughs> uh, What I will do now, um, I will then commit my changes to, to GitHub, and that will, uh, that should trigger uh, a CI job, uh, the Jenkins that is running uh, in, the same, in the same environment, uh, uh, will rebuild the images for me and uh, update deployments of my faulty production environment.
and I will push the master. If not here, I mean, I can do that at work. It's nice to push the master. Okay, changes uh, are pushed. And in this DEFCONF namespace, I've got a, uh, a Jenkins instance uh, with a Jenkins job uh, that, that will receive uh, a webhook. And it will rebuild my images uh, with, with the included fix and it will update, uh, it will update my deployment. Uh, so in, in a minute or so, yeah, you see it's, uh, it's happening right now. Uh, we've got all new deployments uh, in place, except for the Redis database because, you know, it's uh, something static. And I will go in here, and if that doesn't work, <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I need to... I need to do this. It will trigger yet another deployment in, uh, in there. Yeah, so, and I am in. Yeah, <laughs> not sure why, why it hasn't worked. <laughs> uh, with the service, for some reason the route that, uh, the, the, that I have ex exposed, uh, it didn't work. It didn't route back to my, uh, to my pod, to my container with the correct user's API. I swear it worked in the hotel, maybe. <laughs> I need to run my demo in hotels only. <laughs> uh, who knows? So um, that's it for, for, for the demo. Uh, we can take a look at the workspace uh, details in here. So this is how, how my workspace looks like, right? Every component, uh, I can decide uh, how much RAM I need for each of the components. This is a tiny app, so I use half a gig, and I used two gigs for, um, for, the, for the ID, which was my built container uh, as well. So I allocated two, two gigabytes of RAM to, to run Maven builds without, uh, without problems. Uh, there are servers which are, mm, which are exposed services. So I have uh, Thea as a web ID, right? And I have, um, and I have front end, right? I, I need a preview URL for my web application, and that is declared on, on the workspace configuration level. Uh, as I told you, there are shared volumes for all containers, so I can run Maven build in container A with Maven, and then run uh, build artifact in container B, which was my uh, uh, Spring Boot application. So this is the config and this is how YAML looks in a, in a string. So not, not very um, interesting to see. Uh, this is the magic button that I have clicked. So every time I, I will click on, on that link or that you know, uh, picture image with the, with the link inside it, uh, every time Che will create the exact same workspace, right? So if I had a, you know, uh, a public IP for, for this laptop and a little bit more RAM, we could have, you know, interacted and I would ask you to, to click on, to go to, to GitHub and click on that link and uh, Eclipse Che uh, will, will create the same environment uh, for you. All right. Um, This is where you can interact with uh, Eclipse Che team uh, on GitHub Eclipse slash Che or Thea ID Thea. So Che is a workspace 
uh, server, workspace orchestrator. Eclipse Thea is uh, the nice ID in a browser that you have seen. Uh, that is polyglot, that is capable, yeah, or on running on top of Kubernetes or OpenShift, that is capable to providing you uh, access, shell access uh, to containers, uh, run commands and execs in containers. Uh, the Rai Eclipse J docs with instructions on how to deploy your uh, Eclipse J uh, to a local mini shift or to a Kubernetes cluster um, in the cloud. Or you can chat with us on uh, Mattermost. Uh, yeah, it's uh, quite active as well. So if uh, you have questions, you will, uh, you will get answers there. Um, yeah, you may try Che even without installing it. So uh, you go to che.openshift.io, you'll be asked to register uh, with Red Hat Developer Program. You get a login and yeah, you can start a workspace uh, up to three gigabytes, I think. So it's a nice way to, to try and see what, what the service is capable of. And um, yeah, and that's it for today. If you've got questions, you're certainly welcome. All right, then thanks everyone for, for coming. Um, now I have fixed that bug and I need to think of a different one to keep demoing it. Uh, thanks everyone.